Hello everyone, Richard DeClue here. In this episode I want to discuss my thoughts on the traditional Latin Mass. Even amongst conservative or orthodox Catholics, the topic of the extraordinary form, as it's now called, um, is pretty divisive. Um, you can have a lot of heated debates, even amongst people who consider themselves orthodox um, Catholics, over the pros and cons of not only the rites themselves, or sorry, the various forms of the rite, of the Latin rite, um, but also the attitudes of people who attend either form. Um, and I've I've been in those debates before, and I've seen things on both sides. And um, so in this episode, really what I want to do is kind of take you through the, my history, my personal history with the extraordinary form, as well as the ordinary form, um, and then kind of conclude with my current disposition towards the traditional Latin Mass and why I have that. And for this, I'm going to use a lot of material that is found on my blog, which is at um, deklubach.wixsite.com slash sapiencia nulliformis. Um, I'll try to put a link below um, where I did a blog post about this. So check that out for more detail. I'm going to use some things from that, but I don't want it to be nearly as formal and organized um, for this video. But anyway, um, my experience of the Mass. So... Obviously, unsurprisingly, growing up, my earliest memories of the Mass were all Novus Ordo. And I moved around a lot as a kid. Um, we had um, moved from Ohio to Can Virginia to Connecticut, back to Ohio. And then I've been all over the place. I've been to, you know, Boston, Washington, D.C., back to Ohio. I've been all over the place, the Carolinas. Um, been a lot of different places. But growing up early on, um, you know, there was quite a bit of variety from place to place, except for the fact that if, if there was any continuity, it was kind of in this, in, in the 1970s folk music that was often used pretty much no matter where I went. I mean, the one unified factor early on, at least, was that the, litur the liturgical music was almost invariably terrible. Um, you know, as a kid growing up in the 80s, even then, which may have been only a decade later than the 70s, 1970s folk music was not considered contemporary for me. It was not a part of my culture. It was not appealing to me as a child at all. Didn't care for that stuff. Um, but luckily, I was well catechized by my parents. Um, they taught me the meaning of the Mass. They we prayed together at home. We went to first Saturday devotions. We regular confession. Um, and so I was in love with the Catholic faith. And so I went to the Mass for the Eucharist, loved the Eucharist. Um, so, but yeah, but there was always this kind of disconnect between what I was taught was going on in the liturgy. Um <laughs> And what I was hearing, as I used to always say, the soundtrack didn't match what was going on. Like if you watch a movie and you've got this man returning from war after years of being away from his, you know, his young wife, and maybe he never met his firstborn son or daughter, um, and he gets off the train and he sees them on the platform and runs to them and you hear it doesn't work all right the music a good soundtrack is not supposed to detract from what's going on it's supposed to elevate it it's supposed to accompany it um you almost might not even realize it's there consciously if it matches well you might later on reflect on how great the music was, but in the moment, you're almost like the music is part of the experience. It's not a separate thing. Um, and so, you know, if you heard clown music while such a heart-moving, heart-wrenching, moving 
scene was going on, you might think the movie's a spoof, right? Like, I mean, it's a comedy, like the movie Airplane um, or something. Well, then it might fit because it's comedic. Well, sadly, that was my experience of a lot of things early on, which is absolutely terrible music. And unfortunately, there just aren't a lot of places I've been to that actually have good music. But there, ha there were a few. And when I was in middle school and high school, we moved back to Ohio to move in with my grandparents. Um, my parents, my grandparents, my brothers and sister all lived um, in this rural place in Ohio. And the pastor actually had a music background and he loved music. And so I, w I wouldn't say it was what most people would talk about as sacred music per se. I, I just remember that it was much better music. It was more suited to the liturgy. Um, and so f for that, it was, it was, I was really grateful. Um, and not only that, that's where I became an altar boy for the first time, even though I was, I guess, probably 12 or 13, which for some people is late, but um, I was in middle school and um, our training was astounding. I mean, we were taught to a T what we were expected to do at every given moment. And I loved that. Um, every person knew their role and what they were to do, even the water and wine cruets, what side they went on as we brought them up to the altar. Um, I mean, everything. And I loved that. It was perfect because it was just set in stone, made for a smooth ride. There's been a lot of places I've gone to over, over the years where servers don't seem to know what they're doing. They don't even seem like they want to be there. Sometimes they look like they're mad that they have to be there. They're going to slouch like that. We had to have slacks and good shoes on or we would be reprimanded. Um, it was like, it was serious stuff. And I appreciate that because it meant we had to take it seriously. And, and thus serving was actually a great experience for me because I got to enter into that mystery more deeply and the solemnness of it. Um, you know, we used a lot of incense, things like that. It was great. Um, I wouldn't even say it was a, it was an overly traditional parish. It was just, a lot better than what I've been to before. Used incense, had much better music. Um, and so I had that going for me at least. And, you know, in general, overall, I have to say I was, you know, the Novus Ordo Mass has been the primary way throughout my life that I received the most precious gift you can receive this side of the gates of heaven. The most holy sacrament of the altar, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Okay, so for that, I am grateful. And I think that kind of explains some of my future um, takes on this that we'll, we'll come to. Um, so anyway, um, my grandfather, the one that we lived with when I was young in middle school and high school, um, he always had a profound love for the traditional Latin mass. He had been an altar server when he was young. He was not very academically inclined at all, but he still found it perfectly easy to memorize the prayers that the server had to say with, along with the priest. And so he never really bought the idea that it's too hard. Um, although he did say, look, if, if you just want to translate it into English, I would have been okay with that. At least we would have kept the beautiful prayers. It was the actual form of the Mass and the prayers that he missed um, growing up. Um, from when he was growing up till the, the present day. Um, but he missed that so much, the Trinitine Mass, as he would call it, because that's what we referred to it as back then. Um, he had a prayer for the return of the Trinitine Mass on the refrigerator. So I saw that prayer every single day. You can believe me, I was at the refrigerator a lot. Um, but that prayer was posted on the refrigerator. And so I was aware of it. He used to talk about the fraternity of St. Peter. Um, most Sundays, though, he went to Novus Ordo because that's what was around that was available. He wasn't going to let you know, his preference for the traditional Latin Mass prevent him from going to Mass even the Novus Ordo, and he never really bashed it itself. He more just talked about how much he missed the traditional Latin Mass. Um, and, you know, he wished that 
the North sort of would have taken more from that. Um, but every now and again, he would he would drive about an hour and a half or so um, with my grandmother down to a church in Dayton, Ohio. I don't know which one it was, but um, that's where it was. And I went with him at least once, maybe more. Um, he might go down there once a month or once every couple months um, to the Trentine Mass. And I remember going there and I remember loving it. You know, it was good. Um, I didn't really bond with it. I didn't really know exactly what was going on, of course. I think it was a low mass. I'm not sure. Um, my memory of it isn't that clear. Um, but still, I, I had a, I was a personal fan of it, even if I really didn't understand it. Um, didn't really, you know, have a passion for it at that time, but at least planted a seed in me. Um, and over the years, I, I attended a handful of Latin masses here and there, um, including at Old St. Mary's in Washington, D.C., which is famous for having had that. Um, and I can't say I found it that enrapturing. And in, in hindsight, I'm thinking they must have mostly been low masses. That's, that's You'll understand what I mean by that later. Um, but it wasn't that it was bad. I, I did find it difficult to follow. I was like, I don't know how he can be reading this in Latin faster than I can read it in English. Because, um, you know, you have the missile in Latin and English. And I'm like, oh, I'm behind again. I'm like way behind again. How did he get there so fast? Um, trying to figure out what was going on. Um, but still it was reverent. I loved the fact that you received kneeling on the tongue and you were given a benediction with the host. Um, for each communicant. I mean, that was, that's great. You know, I didn't have that growing up. Um, so, but there were a couple things that did bother me. Okay. One, didn't quite understand why the priest had to sit there and read all of the readings in Latin. I didn't understand that. Um, and then he'd go back and sort of speed read them in English right before giving his homily in English. So it was like this recitation of the readings in Latin in, in done in the formal way and then sort of like, okay, well, let's breeze through the English now so I can get to the homily. We've already, you know, let's move things along. And it kind of bothered me. I didn't like the fact that when he was reading the Holy Scripture in English, he acted like it was more of a nuisance than anything else. That bothered me. Um, but then what bothered me even more was I was attending that Mass with a seminarian. Um, who was very fond of the Latin Mass. I'm pretty sure now he's a, an oratorian who I think he might almost exclusively say the traditional Latin Mass. I'm not sure. I haven't talked to him in years. Um, but at the time I attended that, you know, he invited me to go. And so I went. And um, there was this gentleman standing outside who made this comment um, he said something like, you know, oh, it's so good to see you, to my friend. You know, it's so good to see you. It's been so long, I thought we had lost you. And I remember just standing there going, what, what does that mean? He's a, he's a seminarian. We lost him. And the guy meant he hadn't seen him at the, the extraordinary form of the Mass. Well, it wasn't called that back then, but the, the traditional Latin Mass that he thought he lost the seminarian to the Novus Ordo. And now keep in mind, at the time, this guy was a seminarian for a diocese, okay? So the Novus Ordo would have been the ordinary form. And, and I, I took that very poorly. I thought, this is terrible. This guy's acting like the Novus Ordo is a schismatic church and He's, he lost this seminarian to it. It really, it really just kind of put me off as like being holier than thou, self-righteous attitude. Um, it's very, you know, snide comment. Um, and I, I, it, I just got this sense that it was more of a pride than piety that was at the root of what he was saying in his fervor. Now, again, I might be completely wrong, you know, um, but it, for me, it really kind of pushed me off. I was like, I don't like this at all. Like, that's a terrible attitude to have. It, it smacked of something very bad and wrong to me. You know, you're basically insulting my mother, Holy Mother Church, and the sacred liturgy that she has approved. And 
And I just found that to be repulsive, for lack of a better term. Um, and contrast that with people that I knew that went almost exclusively to the Novus Ordo Mass, who I knew to be very pious, very holy. We used to have, you know, um, we were involved in, especially in college, I knew a lot of these people that were, they'd go to Eucharistic Adoration regularly, they prayed the Rosary regularly, they were like involved in like the Legion of Mary, um, men's households, stuff like, and women's households, loved the faith. They were imbued with a deep love of the faith, very orthodox, big on morality and, and sound doctrine. And again, some of the bad theology we encountered in certain instances. Um, and I was, well, these people I knew, they were very pious. Even one of them used to play guitar at some of the masses. And I didn't, I was never really a big fan of guitar mass, but I always saw that young man as a very good and devout person. Um, and so I knew his faith was authentic. And so in contrast that with the, what I saw as the pharisaical attitude of, of some people that I encountered at the traditional Latin mass kind of led me to sort of have a disinterest in being any part of the traditional Latin mass for a while, at least on a regular basis. Um, but nevertheless, I did attend it occasionally. Um, but truth be told, you know, for a long time, I would say that I actually found more solemnity, humble devotion, and authentic piety among Novus Ordo Latin masses. That is, the Novus Ordo said in Latin, yes, that is a thing, it is possible, uh, than I did Trinity masses. Um, I loved it where the, the, the Novus Ordo Latin masses were the Readings were done in vernacular, but everything else was pretty much done in Latin. Um, and then communion was distributed kneeling on the tongue <laughs> with solemn chant as liturgical music. Um, I found that to be the most profound expression of the divine liturgy I had ever encountered. And that includes my experiences I had with different Eastern Rite Catholic divine liturgies, which I also have a lot of respect for. My, not my... I lived with my maternal grandparents, but my paternal grandfather's funeral was actually a Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic divine liturgy. That was my first experience of that. And I thought that was really, it was really neat. Um, the first time I'd received um, Holy Communion with the spoon, which was new for me, but I still, I thought it was very, I understood why they had gone there, even though they were actually technically Latin Rite Catholics. Um, but still, my, uh, for a long time, my favorite experiences of the of the mass were Novus Ordo masses done with chant, mostly in Latin, just with the readings and the collects in English. So, um, like the the parts of the mass that vary from week to week. So the readings, the opening prayer, for lack of a better term, the collect. Um, prayer of the gifts, prayer after communion, those would be in English, but everything else that was um, the same would be in Latin and often chanted. And that was the most profound experience of the Mass I had experienced for quite a long time. Um, you could call that reform of the reform, if you will. Um, but that to me, for a long time, was the most authentically Catholic option. It's where I, f I felt the mysteries most accurately portrayed where I could enter into that mystery the most. Um, but let's get real. I've only experienced that in, I, that I can think of in two places. And I'm sure there are more. I know of other places that do it that way that I just never had the opportunity to go to. Um, so the only two places I really experienced it, the fullness of that both of them were in um, poor Claire monasteries, <laughs> okay? Um, so I'm 40 years old. In those four decades, I've attended thousands upon thousands of divine liturgies in all varieties. Extraordinary form, Ruthenian Byzantine, Maronite, Ukrainian, ordinary form in vernacular, ordinary form in Latin, and everything in between. 
um, one thing stands out to me that I can, after all these years, no longer ignore. I just can't ignore anymore. But as humble and reverent as I might try to be, and as humble and reverent as other congregants might choose to be, the reality of the matter is that the Novus Ordo, as it is currently practiced, widely allows, even legally protects in some cases, the most disrespectful postures and practices that one can imagine within the liturgy itself, most especially the reception of Holy Communion. What do you mean by that? De facto and de jure. So, in fact, and by law, the ordinary form of the Mass, at least almost worldwide, allows for communicants to receive our Lord Jesus Christ himself on the hand. Now, this is not necessarily, at least subjectively speaking, an impious gesture, meaning I have known devout people who receive on the hand, I've seen them do it with devotion and with love and with a sense of reverence. I've done that in, in the past. Um, a case could be made, though, that, well, subjectively or it might not be formally impious, meaning the intention behind it, because if you're brought up thinking that that's perfectly normal, there's no ill will there. But there's a case to be made that materially it, it, it could be considered impious. And I know I'll probably get a lot of negative comments about that, but anyway. In all those masses I've been to, it almost it most often is done irreverently. Even if they don't mean to be irreverent, just what they're doing tends to be irreverent. It's a rare thing to see someone receive on the hand properly and reverently. That's what I'm getting at. It does happen. <laughs> I've seen it. Um, but the vast majority of people that I have seen receiving our Lord in the hand, if not interiorly impious, are at the very least exter externally distracted, rushed, and thus acting impiously. Most hand communicants receive on the run or on the go. They say, Amen, receive the host, walk several steps while raising the host to their mouths. That's so irreverent. Their main concern after hearing the body of Christ is, oh, I need to get out of the way of everyone else. Thus, our dear Lord, during the most intimate part of the entire Mass, is overshadowed by thoughts aimed elsewhere, while people are literally already moving on to the next thing. That is hardly a fitting experience of the most august moment possible on earth. Contrast that with the rubrics of the extraordinary form, where it is required. Sorry about that. It is required in the extraordinary form for people to receive on their knees in humble adoration, directly on their tongue, out of respect for the divine person fully present in the host and accompanied by an individual benediction with the Blessed Sacrament. Okay, that is special. After years of not going to the traditional Latin Mass, my wife and I decided to give it a shot with our children who have special needs, two are on the autism spectrum. Um, that makes going anywhere in public at least somewhat stressful and anxiety-ridden. Um, this Mass was a Misa Cantata, a.k.a. a high mass. Um, and it was glorious. Okay? The chant, the homily, the reverence, it all made me feel like it was in the foretaste of heaven that the mass objectively is. More than I had experienced in a very long time. We have now enrolled at that parish. And, and it is, you know, it's a Catholic parish. I've never been to... Society of St. Pius X Mass, I've never been, and I personally will never go, we'll get to that, but, um, so it's just an extraordinary form Mass offered in our town, and love it, um, we're so excited, we really are. Um, what is more, the priests and the people we encountered so far have not been, by and large, prideful zealots who are defined by their hatred of the Novus Ordo. They've been very kind. We have people who approach us, oh, hey, are you new here? It's great to see you. You know, oh, how are you? You know, 
Um, and, and it's great. It's wonderful to see. Um, we did have one little snafu with someone passing out. I won't get into that, but there was a little bit of a moment where I went, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm not going to let that person ruin it for me. Um, anyway, I could go on and on about how fitting the Latin language is to solemn heavenly chant, because it is. The way that it's written, the sounds, the syllable structure, it lends itself well to chant. I could very well and quite rightly speak of the tremendous sense of the diachronic and synchronic unity. Um, what does that mean? Unity throughout time, and as well as unity within time, at the same time, contemporaneous, um, that the extraordinary form provides. Um, you know, the fact that we're saying pretty much the same prayers, more or less, as going back centuries. Um, I could harp on how great it is to know that, by and large, we're worshiping with the same exact words in the same language as the saints throughout most of the Latin Church's history. All of those would be in our valid reasons to love the extraordinary form. But, you know, Mother Teresa, Pope St. John Paul II, they were no sort of by and large, so I'm not really going to get into that debate. The linchpin for me personally is that I no longer have to see, almost invariably, a plethora of liturgical abuses, witness impious communions, and listen to music discordant with the sacred mysteries truly present and taking place. So while what the traditional Latin Mass has to offer is reason enough to attend it over the Novus Ordo, the real and most compelling reason I want to stay is simply the lack of offenses against our Lord manifestly present on a regular basis that I have continually witnessed during the ordinary form. Sometimes the priests themselves don't want to see some things happen at the Novus Ordo. I know many holy priests that can offer it sacredly and well, but they're still liturgically impotent to prevent some of these things. Um, such as reception of communion. They can't force people to receive um, on the tongue in the Novus Ordo at least not in our country and in most countries. Um, so it makes it really hard for them. Um, so here are my thoughts. I am still allergic to people bashing the Novus Ordo per se. Okay, I understand the whole Bunini thing and I get that. And I understand, okay, trust me, I get it. Worrisome. But just looking at you know, sort of objectively, there's still a lot of good there. And it is one and the same sacrifice taking place. Okay, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of just bashing the Novus Ordo, although there are some reasons people do it. Leave that aside for now. And I will happily attend the Novus Ordo again on occasion. Okay, I will. Um, and that will irritate many of my traditional-minded readers, but I will... I will attend the Novus Ordo before I would ever go to an SSPX Mass. I will not do it. We can get into that in another post, but I will not go. Um, the bottom line is this. I am sick and tired of making excuses for the Novus Ordo based on what it could exhibit in practice but rarely ever reflects. The Liturgy of the Saints in Heaven and on Earth joined together in solemn adoration of the one true and triune God. Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen.